The enduring images of the panzer formations of World War II are the famous battle tanks, the legendary panthers and tigers, which have become synonymous with the Wehrmacht. While they are undoubtedly the best known, they were by no means the most numerous fighting vehicles in the panzer divisions. Every bit as important as these true tanks were their less celebrated cousins of the assault gun and tank destroyer formations. In many respects, they were similar machines to true tanks and frequently did the same job. But they sacrificed the benefits of the turret for the ability to mount a bigger gun, which was carried on a fixed mounting, pointing straight ahead at the enemy. In 1944, during the Battle of the Bulge, the Allies captured this powerful monster, the Sturm Tiger. The troops who knocked out this giant adversary must have breathed a huge sigh of relief, because this devastating machine was so powerfully armed, it had outgrown mere artillery power and was equipped with a rocket launcher of ferocious attacking force. It was designed to attack even the strongest fortification. Due to the range limitations of its rocket launcher, the Sturm Tiger had to get very close to its target to fire its payload. But it was so heavily armored that it was nearly impervious to any anti-tank gun on the battlefield. The Sturm Tiger's role was to rumble right up to infantry bunkers or strong points and fire the rocket at almost point-blank range. Obviously, the chances of survival for its target were slim indeed. The enormous rockets it carried were so heavy, the vehicle needed its own crane to be able to load the shells. Once loaded, the inside of the tank was so cramped, it carried enough rounds for only 13 shots. But when it did fire, the results were devastating. The Sturm Tiger was the last in a line of turretless tanks, which the German army had produced in increasing quantities since the outbreak of World War II. But this highly specialized vehicle was produced so late in the war that only 19 were manufactured before Germany finally surrendered. The idea was to fire an enormous shell with a sort of plunging round that would come whistling down out of heaven and whop whatever was underneath it, good and hard. But really, a thing like that is a very specialist weapon and was probably, again, like many of the German developments of this time, more trouble than it was actually worth. The number of Sturm Tigers may have been very limited, but other turretless tanks were used in huge numbers by the Germans. Like all successful inventions, they had been adapted and improved over the nine years since their introduction. In that time, their numbers had grown, so that by 1945, they were among the most numerous fighting vehicles in the German army, and with good reason. Many German crews didn't like some of their own vehicles, which were too heavy, too slow, difficult to handle, had bad accommodation problems, had too low ammunition storages. You can have lists and lists of this kind of thing. It's, it's almost a Darwinian process, you know, the survival of the fittest, as it were the survival of the most suitable for the battlefield, the survival of that equipment which, uh, which is workable and handleable and, and, and can be profitably and successfully used by the crews. Unfortunately, the first attempts to produce a specialist tank hunter favoured the simple expedient of mounting a 4.7 centimetre anti-tank gun on the chassis of the tiny Panzer I. It was a failure. Although the 4.7 was more effective than the puny 3.7, which originally equipped the Panzer III, it was still feeble compared to the 75mm gun of a Russian T-34. In addition, the open fighting compartment gave only limited protection to the crew. Another problem was the instability of the top-heavy assembly. Frequently, these tank hunters simply toppled up. During 1942, frustrating attempts were made to improve upon the Panzer I in the form of the Marder II and III tank destroyers. 
These strange hybrids use the Panzer II chassis, the Czech 38T chassis, and sometimes even mounted a captured Russian 76mm anti-tank gun. They proved to be little more than an improvised stopgap in a steadily worsening situation on the Eastern Front. But they did go some way towards holding the advancing tide of Russian armor, while real tank killers could be developed. They discovered very early in 1941 that they didn't have anti-tank capability. They just didn't. So what they did, they, they, they improvised and they took, as you know, the uh, Czech 38T tank, it was a Czech tank, built by Škoda, uh, and stuck a captured Russian anti-tank guns on top of it. And that became, you know, the Marda, the Marda Drei. The, the first Marder was actually an anti-tank gun stuck on a French Lorraine chassis. Well, that wasn't much good. But you really had to do something very quick. And the strange thing is that the, that whole series of uh, German vehicles produced on the chassis of, of the Czech 38T and the 38D became really very successful. Partly because the chassis and the suspension was very good, and partly because they put the right guns on it. And so when you've got machines like that, which in fact perform very well, whatever their hybrid origins, if they work in the field, that's fine. But that's an extraordinary story, I think, of the marriage between Czech tank design, uh, Russian anti-tank guns, uh, and, and if I may put it this way, German adaptive engineering, and you, you get virt virtually a, a different weapon system, and a very successful one, uh, and which in fact even outlasted the um, end of the Second World War. The first two specialized tank hunting machines proved to be almost as disappointing as the Marder's. The massive Elephant looked good on paper. It was based on the 80 Porsche chassis, which had been built for a proposed rival to the Tiger. This gave the five-man crew the same all-round protection as the Sturmgeschütz. In addition, the Elephant was massively armored and sported the deadly 88mm gun. It made a much heralded debut at the Battle of Kursk. Despite all the portents, the Elephant proved to be an unmitigated disaster. They needed vehicles to get out to the, to the Eastern Front, and so what the German Army did was they welded on the back end of this big chassis a, um, a citadel, armored uh, it, and put a big 88mm gun. What they failed to do, however, was put a machine gun on it, and so you had Russian infantry climbing aboard and, and burning the crews. Soviet tank hunting teams had a field day. The hapless crews inside the Elephant had no means of effective resistance against infantry, and 40 of the 80 Elephants deployed at Kursk were destroyed in the first two days of fighting. It wasn't everybody's favorite. It was very difficult to handle. It was a huge target itself. I mean, who wanted to be burned alive or blown to pieces in one of these things? So, uh, very rapidly, the German Ordnance Corps develops a machine gun that all you had to do was pop the hatch, stick this thing out, and it had a curved barrel. And you could hose the vehicle off with this curved barrel weapon. So, uh, a very innovative way to do things. The remaining machines were ignominiously withdrawn to be refitted with machine guns before being sent to Italy, where the survivors were destroyed in the battles following the Anzio landings. More effective in battle than the Elephant was the Nashorn, or Rhinoceros. It also featured the fearsome 88mm gun, but inexplicably left the crew unprotected in an open fighting compartment. The high silhouette of the Nashorn made it an easy target but nonetheless, nearly 500 were issued between 1943 and 1944. The Nash Horn was the chassis of the Panzer IV that uh, they took the turret off of and put um, not so well armored, but a, a citadel on the back of that. And they also put an 88 millimeter gun on that. And the idea was, of course, to pick off the, the uh, Russian tanks at least.